Hi, and welcome to the History Respawn podcast. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. On today's episode, we're discussing a new academic book on historical video games entitled Women in Classical Video Games, published by Bloomsbury. This book features a collection of new essays on some of our favorite games here at History Respawn, including chapters on Assassin's Creed Origins, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Hades from Supergiant Games, and God of War. This new volume also explores the depiction of the classical world in some games and on some platforms that History Respawn hasn't covered yet, particularly mobile games. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, this book includes essays written by previous guests on History Respawn, including Dunstan Lowe and Kate Cook. To help me explore this book's content in classical video games more generally, I've invited onto the show the editors of Women in Classical Video Games, Dr. Kate Cook and Dr. Jane Draycott. Dr. Kate Cook is Associate Lecturer at the University of St. Andrews. Her research interests include gender and language in Greek tragedy and the reception of ancient women. She has forthcoming works on praise and blame in Greek tragedy, as well as women in Greek tragedy. Fans of History Respond will remember Dr. Cook as a scholarly guest for our episodes on Hades, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Total War Troy, and Civs 101 Greece. <laughs> Kate, welcome back to History Respond. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be back. Sure. Uh, we should uh, get you a badge or uh, some kind of marker <laughs> of distinguish, uh, yeah. uh, distinguish you as a, a multiple-time guest. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Jane Draycott, who is lecturer in ancient history at the University of Glasgow and the co-director of the University of Glasgow's Games and Gaming Lab. Dr. Draycott studies science, technology, and medicine in the ancient world, and has begun to explore the use and abuse of history and archaeology in video games. Dr. Draycott was recently named nominee for Best Educator by the Scottish Games Award. Congratulations. Uh, Jane, welcome to History Respond. Thank you for having me. So this book focuses on classical video games, and I'm wondering, before we get to the topic of women in classical video games, if we could talk generally about the continued popularity of the ancient world in video games. And in the last decade, you know, we've had major releases, AAA games like Assassin's Creed Origins and Odyssey set in the ancient world. We've had indie games like Hades set in the ancient world and involving ancient mythology. And then there's almost too many uh, mobile games set in the ancient world to count. And so I'm wondering, I'll start with Jane. Um, what do you think it is about the classical world, the uh, ancient world, that makes it such a popular setting for developers and then for players? I think the main thing is the familiarity of it, because in Western Europe, in North America, we've basically grown up on ancient Greek and ancient Roman history, culture, mythology. We, in some cases, have the remnants of it in the places where we live, in our local museums, but just more broadly in, in our, our general culture, we know about the Greek myths, we know about the Roman emperors. And so that familiarity means it's quite easy, I think. It, it, a, lot of the, a lot of the foundational work is already done for uh, developers. They don't, they don't have to introduce their brand new IP because it's already somewhat known to to the, the to the players and there's also a lot of uh, other popular culture you know tv films novels etc so even if people haven't played video games based in classical antiquity they've seen a tv show or a film uh, we 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 sort of see it in, it goes in fashions, doesn't it? it? Periodically, there are a whole bunch of ancient set films that come out, ancient set TV, ancient set novels, and they're, they're trendy for a while and everybody sort of consumes them. And it's not, it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that in a lot of video games, the aesthetic is very similar to what you see in TV and films. The characters are drawing on the sort of canonical periods of history so you know that the fall of the roman republic um classical athens or sparta peloponnesian war things like that 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 we 
we have seen either in our education or in our popular culture. Kate, do you have anything to add? You've been on multiple episodes of History Respawn where I ask you the exact same question, but just anything yes, that I... has come up. Um, yes, but I think my answer is kind of always evolving as well. The more these games come out, the more we kind of need more answers because because sort of familiarity gets you so far and then you think okay but that was true for the last ones why are we still needing more games on this and <laughs> i think also there's there's developers and and you know creatives as jane says absolutely it also reflects wider creative interest in in the period are also um find that the ancient world is is familiar enough but also distant enough um, that it can become quite a sort of almost safe playground um, and I think particularly the kind of general popular culture knowledge of myths alongside history um, makes for quite a, a sort of um, at least for sort of game development so quite a productive tension because you can do things like even in the more historical games there's quite often some inclusion of the fantastical and that then ends up being associated with you know ideas about the gods or mythology or so on and so there's this idea that the sort of the slightly fantastical the slightly unrealistic is just lurking beyond the history in a lot of these periods they're kind of far enough away that 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 seems okay whereas i think maybe games you know set in in more modern periods of history that's harder it's not impossible but sometimes it seems harder to bring in these sort of supernatural or magical elements which are quite often quite a big part of, of sort of gaming culture more widely mm -hmm. the, the sort of combination of almost sci-fi or fantasy elements um it seems like many many developers find that a nice thing to be able to bring in in a way that they, they can do with the ancient world even in historical set games mm -hmm. so i think that has a kind of a big influence on it as well well, the sources that they're drawing on tend to do that, don't they? I mean, even even historiography will talk about omens, portents, dreams that uh, generals have the the night before battle, and the thing is with that, obviously, it's this is that this is a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three thousand years ago. You know, his, historical periods they they do that. But then just a few weeks ago when the Queen died, the newspapers were full of the rainbows that appeared above Buckingham Palace at that very moment as, as if that was in fact some kind of um, divine symbol or signal. So it's, it's clearly something that uh, hasn't entirely gone away. Mm -hmm. So Jane, I want to ask you a follow-up question. You you'd brought up the kind of topic of... Uh, movies and historical fiction, um, TV shows that are set in the ancient world and in antiquity. And I'm wondering, in your experience as an educator, do you find that students and others in the public are more interested in talking about those kind of other versions of historical fiction? Or do you find that games are becoming more popular? Do you have students, for instance, coming up to you, you know, in class or in seminars asking about these types of games? I think this is something that is actually always changing because when I started as a university lecturer and I was in, in my previous um, position, uh, the university that I worked at there, I was actually responsible for the admissions to the, the uh, classics degree scheme. And that, that meant I read UCAS forms and I read personal statements. And over the, the years that I did that position, what people were writing in their personal statements about what had inspired them to get interested in classics was changing. So it went from Harry Potter to Percy Jackson, um, <laughs> from Michael Scott to Mary Beard. And as I, as I left that position, I was starting to see a little, a little bit here and there of, uh, of video games. And now, some, some years later in my, in my current position, I have a, a lot more students who are interested in video games than than anything else really so yes it's definitely become a lot more mainstream i guess i would say um or or possibly perhaps people were always playing the games but they didn't necessarily feel like it was something that they could say it, <laughs> in a sort of an academic situation that was definitely me um, for sure <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean when when I was an undergraduate, um, people were playing you know, the, the, the very sort of um, you know, the, the strategy games um, and they were being used on time commanders and, and other TV programs like that. Whereas now, of course, it's not just 
the the total war and and the, the sort of military strategy game it's a whole lot of other stuff as well and and uh yeah pe people are, are wanting to talk about them they are wanting to write essays on them they are wanting to do their dissertations on them and i've even had some um potential phd candidates wanting to do their, their phds on those and i know kate has recently as well so i think that is that is interesting in itself that as uh as students become more comfortable talking about games in academic settings, they they really want to talk about them and, and devote a significant amount of their education and their educational life to them. Yeah, I think um, I you know I've I've seen the same trend, but something else I think that's quite interesting in terms of them becoming more mainstream is um, I was talking with my undergraduates. We did you know some work on uh, classical reception in games a few weeks ago, and I asked them you know okay how many of you have played these games, and it was not the whole class. It was sort of um, about a third of them, and then I said well how many of you have seen them advertised or seen you know posters or trailers, and all of them had seen at least Assassin's Creed Odyssey advertised pretty much everywhere. They said they were really familiar with that it existed the setting um some of the kind of main character um aesthetics and that kind of thing um and i'm not sure that would have been true you know 10 20 years ago you really didn't see the kind of very mainstream advertising of these big games you wouldn't have seen them in trailers in the cinema and that sort of thing um so i think even people who are not engaging with these games as players are still seeing a lot more of them than i, th I think they used to and I think when when games do come out set in classical antiquity, it's it's something that uh, students will talk about because when when I was an undergraduate, um, Gladiator came out just before I started university, and then Troy and Alexander came out while I was at university, and talking about those, whether they'd seen them or not, they they were uh, talking about them. So it it does become a sort of I guess a background noise. Uh, it's it's just like today when when a when a, a classical film comes out, a classical TV show is on. Uh, you may not have seen it, but somebody will have seen it, and and they will ask you, or have you have you seen this? What did you think of it? So it's it's part of the sort of I mean, the vernacular of of being a, a classics or an ancient history student now that this stuff is is happening, and maybe you'll want to to participate in it if only so that you can you know. Uh, play a drinking game or, or fact check it or uh, <laughs> you know, talk about it on, on uh, social media in some capacity. <laughs> well, uh, or it uses the basis for serious research uh, like this book. Uh, and so this volume, it focuses on the depiction of women in classical video games. And I think it does a really excellent job of exploring one of the key issues related to women in history games. And that's the issue of historical accuracy, you know, in scare quotes. And I'm wondering, I'll start with Jane, could you talk a little bit about how claims of historical accuracy are often used with relation to the depiction of women in historical games? Yes, I mean, I think I can do that quite succinctly. And the the claims about historical accuracy and women in uh, classical uh, video games is that they shouldn't be there, uh, frankly. If, if this was going to be a completely historically accurate game, there would be no women whatsoever because women were locked up in the house having babies and they had nothing to do with anything. They had no public roles whatsoever. They had no power. They had no influence. Um, the only thing that they could possibly do is look sexy in, in the background and, and be some kind of reward for uh, a particularly... Uh, uh, competent hero. Kate, anything so, to add on to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is something we both um, sort of find particularly interesting. And, and coming at this from the perspective of someone who sort of mo works more in the kind of literary and, and mythological side of things, um, I was particularly struck when doing research for this book um, by the number of people who would make similar claims about games set in kind of mythological times. Um, so I mean, we mentioned this in the introduction to our book, but the claim that it's not historically accurate to have Amazons in Total War Troy um, is, is mind blowing because it is poetically accurate. They do form part of the epic cycle, which 
the kind of War of Troy is told in, there isn't really any proper histor historical source for, and I know this is making the news in the UK again about kind of historical dates for Troy at the moment. So, um, you know, we haven't got that. There are archaeological attempts to reconstruct some of the history and to work out if there was some history, but there is no kind of history there's no written history of a war in troy all we've got is the iliad and uh, the odyssey and awareness of the other poems that came around them and amazons are absolutely in those so it is accurate but because of kind of ideas about what should be there um we get these criticisms saying this this isn't historically accurate for a what is effectively a non-historical setting um which is which is i think quite um I mean, we found it, I think, quite mind blowing in some ways, the, the sort of the level of, of rhetoric going on there. It, you know, it really does reveal a lot more about other people's modern ideas about history and accuracy than actual accuracy insofar as there is such a thing. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the dissonance is astounding when it seems that these this desire for historical accuracy is very selective. So it absolutely needs to be applied to anything to do with women, but not to do with anything else. So I mean, uh, war pigs, I think, is a is a is a popular one that that uh, gets gets used in in various um, military contexts. When I think there's 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 one reference to them somewhere in in one specific occasion. Um, things like magical powers i mean we obviously we we know that the the ancient greeks and romans were, were had very different ideas about the gods than we do today but uh they they weren't um your your average roman soldier wasn't a wizard you know with with uh fabulous combat powers and and uh um sentient weapons and things like that so uh so yes this 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 very selective application of these these historical standards is uh <laughs> tiresome <laughs> <laughs> to what extent do you think those historical standards related to women are kind of native to games or do you think you know we had main reference to other historical fictions about the ancient world you know how much are games aping you know what you have from historical novels historical films historical tv shows is there kind of something intrinsic to games that kind of perpetuates this negative stereotypes related to women or is this something that is just carrying forward from a century or more of popular culture I don't actually think it's unique to games. Uh, I mean, I in in my in my other sort of academic research, I work on um, disability, for example, and uh, a sort of a very common um, sort of general understanding is that um, there there were no disabled people in antiquity because they would all have been killed at birth, um, and that's just simply not true. There's plenty of evidence to to the contrary. But it is just this this sort of received wisdom about what the past was like, and so, and, and I guess as far as video games are concerned, you don't tend to see a whole lot of disabled people in ancient video games, despite the fact that we know that many soldiers and, and a lot of uh, classical video games are military related. Um, people were not automatically um, invalided out of ancient armed forces upon losing an eye or, or losing a hand or, or anything else, they continue to, to be um, in, in uh, uh, military contexts. Uh, so this, so games are, are very selective in, in what they choose to present to the audience. So I think it's not unique to games. Um, it is found in, in other areas, but I think possibly what is unique to games or, or at least more prevalent in the in the gaming community fandom whatever you want to call it is the the sheer volume at which um a minority will complain about it <laughs> and we do see that in other things like so we we see it in for example at the lord of the rings fandom recently about having yes. yeah. ethnic minorities and, and women playing prominent roles in in um in the rings of power so, so it does happen in other places, but it it does seem to be fairly consistent in in the gaming community that there will be uh, 
this very vocal minority that will um, make their displeasure known through um, things like review bombing and doxing and, and stuff like that. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I agree. I think it's not, it's absolutely kind of obviously not unique to games. Um, but one thing I think that is quite interesting is that the narrative in, in other areas of um, sort of classical reception, so modern works that look at, that are set out and kind of rework ancient stories, um, is there's been kind of a shifting of the narrative in many of these. And particularly, there's been a huge trend in the last, I mean, even 30 years of um, telling, you know, women's stories. Um, so things like novels like the Penelope ad, um, taking the Odyssey and, and telling it from Penelope's side. Um, and there's, you know, been a trend of that in drama as well. And even to some extent in, in TV recently. Um, what we haven't seen yet, it seems to me, is the equivalent trend in games. And that I wonder, I wonder if that is because of the kind of the, the very, very vocal communities, the fact that kind of gender in games more broadly is still an issue which is attracting mm -hmm. sort of too many complaints about women's presence and women's involvement and so on. Um, I, I wonder if that's causing them to effectively lag behind in a way which perhaps is more unique to the gaming community yeah. than... Um, some of the other sort of perpetuation of narratives, which is which is absolutely coming from elsewhere. But as I say, other places it seem to be moving in different directions, and I'm not sure games is is following those directions yet. Yeah, I think well, that's, that's you're probably not... right. Yeah, I I mean, well, just to add very briefly, you know, a big undercurrent of this book uh, is kind of uh, going off the work of Anita Sarkeesian, and you know, kind of looking at general tropes and uh, related to women in games and. A big part of her kind of original series was looking at God of War. You know, it was like looking at this very famously uh, game, very popular game set in the ancient world, and yet uh, all sorts of instances of violence uh, to the perception of women, but then violence to women in the game perpetuated by the player. So I think there's something there's something to that meeting the audience expectations when it comes to what does it mean to have a, a game set in the ancient era? And then what does it mean, you know, for the player vis-a-vis -vis women in that type of game? I think those two things are very important. Uh, sorry, Jane, I cut you off. No, I was, I was just going to say, um, with all the information that has come to light recently about various game studios and the experiences that the the female and non-binary and ethnic minority and um gay and, and and anybody anybody else who works in those companies who is not a straight white man has um it's not entirely surprising that these these sorts of stories wouldn't be being told in companies where there is such uh an an unwelcoming, uninclusive environment, because a lot of the time, the people who want, I mean, there is a reason that Kate and I decided to focus on this topic. And the fact that we're both women is, is fairly central to that reason. You know, we, we play games and while we enjoy them, we don't necessarily see ourselves in them in the same way that we you know, we we um, we navigate ancient history and literature, and and we don't necessarily always see ourselves in that. So we go looking for for the things that resonate with us a bit more. And so, yeah, for for the people who are potentially would want to tell these stories and make these games, they are not being given the opportunities because the the people who are in the sort of more senior positions, the creative directors. They're men. They're they're white men. They're straight men. They are abusive men in in uh, a number of cases. So it it really shouldn't be surprising that the games industry is lagging behind because it's it's hard. It is hard to make a game. It is expensive to make a game. You need lots of people and lots of time and lots of money to make a the kind of AAA game that um, God of War or Assassin's Creed is. So. That is not something that a, a, an ambitious, creative person can do on their own. Yeah, so, you know, this book, um, I really enjoyed it, you know, not only because of the kind of breadth of the 
analysis, but also kind of the focus that it has on more recent titles uh, related to classical video games. And uh, this includes uh, chapters that you have on Hades, uh, chapters that you have on uh, Assassin's Creed Origins, and then, of course, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And these games have gotten a lot of praise uh, you know, for having women in more central roles, sometimes as the player character. Um, but there are still kind of lingering problems that this volume points out with those depictions of women by these games, and maybe some of them are carryovers uh, from older games set in the classical era. And so I'm wondering, and I'll start with Jane, uh, you know, in particular with reference to your chapter uh, in this volume on Cleopatra. Uh, I'm wondering... In your judgment, where do you think more recent games set in the classical world, where do you think they have improved on the depiction of women? And where do you think that there's still need for improvement? They have improved by acknowledging the presence of women, the participation of women in ancient daily life in areas beyond the bedroom. Um, but at the same time, so take Assassin's Creed Origins, for example, which is a great game with a great story, and you get to play parts of that game as uh, a female assassin, Aya, but only very, very small parts of, of that game. I, I think it may have been that originally she was meant to it, it was meant to be much more um, equally divided between uh, Bayek and Aya, but but the the Aya parts were sort of were minimised. And then we see in Assassin's Creed Odyssey for the first time you you have the the option to play through the entire game as uh, as a female character. And in, in fact, I think Cassandra is the canonical character, um, and Alexios is is not. But at the same time, you wouldn't know it because most of the marketing is is done with with Alexios. But in that situation, great, okay, you you can play the game as as a female character. It makes no difference whatsoever to the story. They are exactly the same character doing exactly the same stuff with exactly the same outcomes. So in some respects, it's it's great that women are being acknowledged. It's great that they're being included somewhat more, but they are still, they are not necessarily female characters having female experiences. They are just playable characters with longer hair um, or, you know, um, a slightly different shaped armor. It's, it's, uh, and, and I think that's, I mean, you mentioned God of War earlier and the, the, the older God of War games and the sort of atrocious ways that women were featured in those. But in the new God of War game, um, well, I say the new one, the, 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 recent, the, the most recent one that has yet been released, yeah. um, where were the women characters in that? There was the dead mum. Um, <laughs> there, there were the Valkyries that you butchered horribly. Um, there, you know, it's, 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 it's not as if the, the, port the portrayal of women in the new God of War was any more nuanced than the old God of War. It was, it was somewhat less egregiously sexualized somewhat. Um, but, but still, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is, it is still problematic in, in many respects. So I think I, I guess I would say perhaps that the, the the doorway has been sort of open a crack. It's 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 a jar, but you know that there's still quite a lot <laughs> that needs to be done, really. Mm -hmm. Kate, is there anything you want to add? Um, no, I'd I'd completely agree. I mean, I think one of the things one of the things I would like to see games doing more now is almost explicitly engaging with more of these questions of gender so if you have a kind of female playable character then then raise that talk about that you know what difference does it make it should it ideally it should make some difference otherwise as jane says all it is is cosmetic if, it, if no one ever mentions that you're a woman and no one ever responds to you as a woman kind of in the game world are you really a female character or are you just you know kind of neutral and if the neutral activities that you're taking part in are sort of default male so you know military combat activities 
it's not really doing anything to represent female experiences, female lives. The actual women of the ancient world are not in that game. You know, there's, the Cassandra doesn't represent any of them, really. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure it does enough, in my view, to shine a light on, you know, the real women of the ancient world, the women that, insofar as we can excavate them, did have some parts in society um, that, that could have been really, you know, interestingly and fruitfully developed by some of these games. Um but they just haven't. I mean, for example, we're, we we know that one of the places that women did get involved in society is in kind of religious roles as priestesses, but also taking part in festivals and so on. And wouldn't it be really great if for one of these quests, you know, if you're playing as Cassandra, you have to carry out a mission by participating in a festival. And if you're playing as Alexios, you have to carry it out in a different way. So the gameplay goal is the same, but the kind of experience of playing it. it is changed. I know that would require more work, but it, it would be a much more um, kind of interesting representation of gender. And that's, yeah. that's what I'd like to see more of. Well, and as somebody who has um, just turned 40 and has been playing video games for on and off 30, four years or so, I think that that kind of diversity of representation sounds more interesting, not just as a scholar, but also as a game player, right? To have some sort of different requirements, different game mechanics included, you know, because I've I've been strategizing the Peloponnesian War and lopping people's heads off in RPG games for 30 some odd years. And I'm a bit bored with it, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, and so just having that kind of diversity of representation, I think would be great uh, as a, a scholar, as somebody interested in this kind of topic, you know, from that angle, but then also as a player, you know, um, and I think, you know, there's maybe some opportunity in um, a game that we looked at, Kate, uh, the Discovery Tour mode uh, with Assassin's Creed, where you do have in that featurette, at least with Odyssey, you have some mention of different roles for women. Um, but how many players actually interacted with that? How many of them go through and actually read the ancillary materials that are included in the database, I have no idea. I don't even know if Ubisoft knows. Who knows? And as I complained at the time, of course, that tour on women is itself one of the kind of shorter, less fully fleshed out tours. So even even in the kind of educational area, you get the impression that it's very kind of slimmed down in mm -hmm. terms of the variety and diversity of, of women's lives as well, because women were not just sort of some monolith, but it's just kind of mm -hmm. all all non-men lived exactly like this in the Greek world is, is kind of equally nonsense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so mobile games are kind of an underexplored area of historical game studies and game studies more generally. And I was really excited to see sections of this book dedicated to that topic. And Kate, you've got one of these chapters that is focused on mobile gaming. And I wonder if you could walk us through what you saw with the depictions of women in historical mobile games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's a shame um, that mobile games are so sort of under discussed because um, some of the games, it's worth saying, you know, there's a huge variety of mobile games out there and some of them reproduce many of the things that we see in kind of console or PC games. So there are city builders that are very similar to existing PC city builders. There are kind of light strategy games or, or kind of... Um, little sort of mythological story quest games that, that seem very much like existing games. And of course, Assassin's Creed are making a mobile game now. So the kind of overlap between existing game franchises and mobile gaming is likely to become even stronger. Um, but one of the things that um, really struck me and why I wanted to sort of bring attention to this is that mobile games often also cater to a very different audience, the sort of non-traditional gamer, the person who just picks up their phone and plays a little bit of, of a game at a time. Um, with things like um, the type of game that I looked at, these sort of graphic novel type mobile games, um, which are about sort of playing through a story and contributing particular choices to that story to change the ending or change your romance interest. Quite a lot of these are sort of romance story um, novels. Um, and I was kind of really struck by the fact that these games explicitly think of their audience very often as young women. Um, they That's absolutely who they expect their default player to be in a way that just does not apply for sort of strategy games or, you know, the, the strategy games and things have started to recognize that there are some female players, finally, um, even if their fan bases have not always recognized that. But they would never come out and say our default player 
is is a young woman whereas these sort of mobile story games absolutely they're archetypal player they expect to be a young woman um and that really changes and certainly in the game i looked at choices and their kind of rome set story it really changed the way that they were talking about things like gender so kind of issues of consent were really important to them because they knew they would be really important to their sort of young female players that they didn't want feeling as players forced into situations that they weren't comfortable with um and kind of questions of women's agency in the historical period became something which they they raise as part of the character experience in in fact exactly the way i've just been saying i would like you know more rpgs to be doing um this mobile game is doing it because they think that you know that's what their players are going to want they're going to want this question of you know well they're going to want to play as a woman probably um and then they're going to want to think about well how does that interact with this historical setting in a much more explicit way they're not just going to want that white whitewashed over um and they're also going to want a sort of, sort of certain level of agency as a player so the kind of balance between these competing demands is, is set in a very different place and very different kind of context um around player expectations and so on to that we see in some of the more sort of traditionally studied games like strategies or rpgs um and it results in a very different portrayal of of women you know you get a lot more women doing kind of very different character roles um a lot more as i say discussion of women's agency and women's lives um which i think is really valuable for sort of almost resetting the picture in terms of showing what other games could also be doing um but also reminding us that you know these games are out there as well and you know this rather different player base is experiencing their version of the ancient world through this not through total war games or whatever it might be and that's quite i think quite significant yeah i i just uh, you know and this is something that it's not just a a criticism that I'm lobbing at, you know, games journalists or other game scholars. This is something that, you know, we haven't really covered on History Respawn at all is mobile gaming. And, you know, it's really a shame because I think when we talk about the ever increasing popularity of games, when we talk about the type of games that most people in the public or most students will come into contact with, it is not something like uh, a Total War game. It may be not even be something like Assassin's Creed, despite how popular it is. It will likely be a mobile game. And you know, I tell people all the time, um, the first time that my daughter, uh, she's seven, uh, but the first time she asked me about a historical figure was there was a representation of Abraham Lincoln in a uh, tablet game that she was playing. And that was when she was two or three years old. And so, you know, that is that is the moment where, you know, that kind of comes to my mind is like this is this is really where most people are coming into contact with games, but then also historical games and, you know, what do those depictions say? So I was I was really thankful to to read some of that content in this book. Yeah, I mean, it's the fastest growing sector of the games industry in terms of, you know, the amount of, of money going in and coming out of it at the moment. And the thing is, because you don't necessarily need to pay for an expensive console or a gaming mm -hmm. PC or mm -hmm. something, most people now, you know, have multiple phones in their household, even if, you know, your two-year-old hasn't got one <laughs> at parents. And oh, so, it's, you know, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of well, time. Well, yeah, exactly. It will also be just a matter of time. You know, it may... In, in some households, they may, kids may never get a gaming console, but they probably will have a mobile phone. So the kind of accessibility of these games, the access to these games as well, is is um, increased in a mm -hmm. sort of quite dramatic way compared to access to to console gaming and so on. So mm -hmm. they they are they are becoming a huge sector, and they will continue to be a huge sector of the gaming industry. Yeah. I think it's um it's interesting, Kate, what you said about the. The, the people who are making the mobile games are very much concerned about their audience and what their audiences will take from these games because that's something that you don't necessarily see when games are made for supposedly educational purposes. I mean, I was um, I was made aware a few years ago of uh, a Roman fort museum that had created an educational game for children who who would come to the fort and in this educational game um the the child who was playing the game um was playing the role of a child slave in the fort and i responded to this in a way that i don't think the person describing the game for me really anticipated 
and I raised the issue with them that a child slave living in a Roman fort would have had an absolutely horrible life um, and would would have been subjected to all sorts of horrific abuse and in in the section of the game actually that they that they showed it, it was it was very uncomfortable watching this this child being sort of loomed over by this sort of menacing soldier figure and I mean I I, I don't know what happened with that game I, I haven't I haven't been to to that museum I, I haven't seen the finished game um so so possibly um I I uh well um but but the, the thing is in, in a situation like that you you know obviously with with if you're making a game for children that there there are certain things you're you're not going to include in that game but at the same time if you're making that game you you need to be aware of those you know you need to be aware that if you're trying to educate people about a certain period of history that you are presenting the somewhat historically appropriate um you know if if, if you have to um bodlerize that completely then possibly that's not the, the game and the subject of the game that you should be using and and that's something that i find interesting with this idea of using things like assassin's creed um origins and odyssey discovery tours um in in schools and and in in uni well not not so much university because university students are adults and you know um but but using them in schools and how does that affect what's included in the tours and what's excluded and when it comes to subjects like slavery we already suffer from very poor education about that subject in all periods of history and, and this this sort of somewhat um sanitized romanticized version of it uh so it is it is good to see different different companies different developers starting to think to themselves okay well we, we we're going to do this um how can we do this in such a way that it's it's true to the subject but it's also appropriate for the audience that that we are presenting it to and i think i think that's it's good to see thought um being put into this this sort of stuff um because we as educators think about that stuff when we present uh, this material to our students even when they are adults um so if games are going to be used for educational purposes that's something that should be taken into account too mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think you know it's it's worth saying that being a mobile game doesn't necessarily automatically bring that level of thought in i think the studio that make this particular game choices have also made that kind of part of their general process that they want to engage with social issues one of their very first games um, was about high school students and was connected to an anti-bullying charity um, to kind of help to help kids play through experiences of kind of being bullied and bullying and kind of pass on the message about how important it was to talk to people about that um, so they've always kind of had this this sort of socially conscious focus in the way they design their games. Um, but I think also, you know, the, there's a massive difference here in terms of the widespread proliferation in some areas. So if you're an Assassin's Creed or you're, a, you know, a game in a particular Roman fort that people go to, the competition is quite limited. There's not going to be, a, you know, people who want to play Assassin's Creed, there's no real alternative. You just play the Assassin's Creed games. If you go to this fort to play a game, then, you know, there's not 12 different companies lining up saying, here, you could play this one, which has got a much better take on slavery. It's, you get what you get. Um, whereas with mobile games, you know, there's so many of them. Even just of these kind of romance stories, I'm aware of at least six of the most, that's just the most popular ones. I'm sure there are kind of hundreds more. I just haven't scrolled all the way down. Um, some of which have ancient stories and some of which don't. So, you know, there's there's constant new competition as well in the sort of mobile marketplace. And I think in some ways um, that that makes them kind of strange and precarious, but it also does often mean that they have they do have to kind of think about how they're going to treat these issues differently from one another and kind of in a way that's going to attract audiences differently, mm. um, which kind of sets sets other design processes apart. So kind of a final question here. Um, I'll pitch this to Jane first. Uh, you know, you've 
done a lot of work. Uh, the authors of these chapters in this book have done a lot of work to kind of explore this issue of women in classical games. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, is there any part of this, uh, you know, that you wanted to see further developed? Is there any place where you think this research can go uh, past this point, past this publication? Well, just as just as in classics and ancient history and classical archaeology as disciplines at the moment, there is a lot of discussion about what what counts as classics what counts as ancient history you know we're not just greece and rome we we are also persia and and other um, neighboring civilizations um i think that's something that is quite interesting to think about i mean we, we started this 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 whole conversation with we're talking about you know why why is, is classical antiquity so popular it, in gaming and it's, it's popular because it's familiar and what I think would be interesting to see is let's let's embrace the the unfamiliar because for example um the kingdom of Kush uh we we know that uh women played very significant roles in in Kush in the military activity you know and they were they were in fact commanding armies and uh putting the the, the romans on the back foot um in in the uh augustan principle for example so but apart from them being one faction in um total war that you could potentially play i mean what what more is what more is there that people have the opportunity to to do in in that arena I mean, Egypt tends to be um, in 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 the sort of in the classical period. It's it's Cleopatra. I mean, Assassin's Creed Origins presented this fantastically rich, detailed um, Hellenistic Egypt, but ultimately it was still about Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. And why why not go a bit further south and look at this neighbouring kingdom and this neighbouring culture that is interacting with the classical world? And with the Roman world, with with uh, the 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 very sort of famous historical figures that we all know about, so that's something that I think I would like to see is is this expansion of of what what is women in classical video games? What are classical women in video games? That more than just you know the the Greek goddesses, um, Cleopatra and the Amazons. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Um, I am going in a slightly different direction, um, kind of where where I am, in fact, taking this research next, um, but where I'd also like to kind of carry on taking it further is I think what we did really well with this book, and I'm really glad we did do, is look at kind of representation of women a lot. Um, what I would like to do next is is think more about the experience of sort of playing gender in, in historical games and in ancient world games. So um, more about what it means to 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 sort of play as a woman um play these kind of female characters and and look more at the intersection between gameplay agency and character agency and where that kind of is and isn't coming out in these games um and that is something which um obviously came up a little bit in my chapter of this book but is, is also something I'm, I'm looking at um in one of my next projects and sort of hope to take much further because i think one of the major differences and in looking at games in comparison to say looking at films or tv or anything is the level of player input that you have in a game um and this is sort of true of all all historical game studies is thinking about you know how does the player contribute to this experience of history um and that i think is where i would like to go next with this is this kind of intersection of, of player input and gender um, and think about what kind of differences that makes to experiences and understanding of gender in the ancient world so we're not going to write exactly the same book, which is ideal, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, just in a general sense, it's very exciting to me to we're kind of doing a series of episodes this fall on um, books written by scholars about historical games. And, you know, in all these instances and looking at edited volumes like this one, it's really exciting for me, you know, having done this for 10 years or so now uh, to have more people involved and in taking it in directions that I I didn't think of, you know, when I was starting History Respond. And so 
it's just really exciting. It's it's very exciting to have more people involved in this and doing really interesting work. And, you know, like with the case of uh, women in games, but then also with mobile games, different platforms, you know, these are all things that I, yeah, I've wanted to cover for a long time. It's just like you can't do it as one person. But now that seems like there's a growing group of scholars and maybe more PhD students with dissertations to add to this literature. And so it's it's gone from being a thing like I feel like six, seven years ago, I felt very alone. Now it's like, oh, there's tons of people in this field now and they're doing all sorts of really great work. And so, yeah, I'm just excited to see what happens with y'all's work, but then also, you know, whoever else gets involved with that. I think the more people we have, the better uh, we'll be prepared to kind of to tackle these kinds of issues and to look at these things. So, yeah. So, all right. Uh, well, I, I think that does it. So uh, the book again is uh, women in classical video games. It's available from Bloomsbury press. Uh, we'll have a link uh, to the book in the show notes in case you're interested. Uh, and Jane, uh, Kate, thank you very much for joining me on this episode of history respond. No problem. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. And thank you, listener. Uh, today's episode will be available on the podcast feed and then later on as a YouTube video. And if you're interested in more work from History Respawn, please visit our website, historyrespawn.com. And if you really enjoy our work, please consider contributing to our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash historyrespawn. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.